Welcome back. I've got another fun scripting tutorial. Yay, scripting. If you're anything like me, scripting isn't exactly the most gripping of topics, but when you do get a handle on it, it can unlock some amazing things within your sample library. So stick around and find out today how you can control multiple attack decay, sustain, and release values within your one instrument. My name is Steve, composer, engineer, and lecturer, and welcome back to the channel. So if you've seen any of my videos before, you know that I've released a few sample libraries now for free on Pianobook, an amazing area and community for practicing your craft as a samplist. You're able to share it with other samplists and get some feedback and kind of see what people can make with your library, which has been really awesome. One thing I'm using it for is so that I can create some cool little libraries and share them with people that want to actually use them, which is always fun, but also then pull them apart and show you how I created them so you can maybe learn a thing or two as well. So today I'm taking a look at envelopes, attack, decay, sustain and release, that sort of thing. But I'm taking a look at how to control with one knob or slider, multiple variables of this. If you've dived into contact scripting yourself, you know that this might not be as simple as it seems. First of all, trying to actually target and change an attack or a decay or release or whatever is quite difficult in itself. Then try to do that across multiple groups because there's a separate attack per group. That can be quite tricky. So today I'm gonna to unpick some of the libraries I've created and show you how they work in scripting so that you can understand how to do it yourself. All right, so first of all, let's take a look at Melosaur and Kaleidosky and what they have to offer and the fact that they've got their ADSR controls there. So Melosaur is this beautiful, warm, analogy synth sound. Beautiful, rich uh, sound developed from my Atura Polybrute. Put it through some tape textures so you can get that kind of tape warble effect. A wonderful multi-purpose 80s inspired cinematic synth. That's the sort of vibe for it. Of course, with this type of instrument, attack, decay, sustain and release are gonna play a huge part in how you shape and tailor this sound for your purpose. So you can see on the screen here, the ADSR filter controls are all here ready to go. So at the moment, I've got very fast attack, a little bit of decay, but full sustain so the decay doesn't even matter, and a little bit of a release so that the note doesn't just cut off. Let's have a look and see how I've scripted that behind the scenes and how it works. Let's dive into the spanner. First of all, the thing to note is if I go to the group editor, you can see that I've got four different groups. Each one of these groups has a modifier attached to it. That modifier is an attack to case sustain release with also hold in there as well. Each one of these groups has that envelope. We can see it there as well and in this last one here. So they all have the same envelope, but they are not all the same envelope. That is very important to understand. There is a separate envelope per group. That means when we want to change it all with one knob or one slider or one control of some kind, we have to be sending out four messages to these four groups. So let me dive into the script editor and take a look at how I conquered it in this one. This is method one, if you will. All right, so we can see our script editor and it's worth mentioning at this point, if you're ever interested in how I've created this, you can dive straight into the script and I've actually sort of divided everything with comments. These little parentheses are just comments. So you can see what things are, how I've structured it, and hopefully make a little bit of sense out of it. So the first thing, of course, is I've created an on init block. I've created my performance view, set my height, width, my background, all that jazz. And if I scroll down here, we can actually see that I've got an ADSR box version. Box I'm just referring to as the different boxes on the UI. This box has the attack to slider, the decay slider and so on, and all of the declarations there to make it work and attach the custom graphics. By the way, if you wanna know how to create your own custom graphics and how to then get them inside contact and script them up, check out this series that I released up here. Three parts that you can go through and check out the various stages of creating the graphics, getting them into contact and then scripting them. All right, so when these sliders become actually very useful is when you attach something to them so that they, they have more purpose than just sort of sliding up and down, of course. When they slide up and down, you want them to control something. The on UI control section is where I've made all these changes happen. If we scroll down to the ADSR box, you can see how I've made these controls. Now, let me explain how the script works. It is a little bit more involved than your average effect or reverb control or wet dry on a delay or whatever. It's a little more involved because we're dealing with modifiers and modulators. We're not dealing with the simple effects controls. So there's a little bit to know about this. Before I do anything, there's a couple of things to understand and do first. Group numbering starts from zero. So your first group is actually group zero. 
second group is actually group one and so on. And that's because it's computer language. Zero is simply the way that computers start from counting. So that means if I scroll down here, we've got group one, two, three, and four, so on. And we've got envelopes that are attached to each one. My advice at this point is to name these envelopes something nice and simple. Right click on the envelope, you can jump into name and you can make a name for it. I choose something simple like ENV for envelope and then the number of that group. You can see here we're in group four, which for computer speak is group three, and we can see envelope three there so that we know that we're always attacking the right envelope. Then you can see what I've done under here is I've used the set engine par command, a very familiar command if you've been doing anything in contact scripting. I've gone to the dollar symbol engine underscore par underscore attack. I'm choosing and selecting and targeting the attack controls. I want to set it with the value of whatever my attack slider is. So when I slide this up or down, it's going to provide the variable with the amount I want to change it to. I'm then targeting the group and you can see why now I have four lines of script here because I'm targeting one line per group. So zero, zero, one, two, and three there, one for each of these four groups. So I specify which group I'm in. Then this section is where it gets a little bit interesting. Modifiers sort of exist inside a group, but outside of group at the same time, they're sort of their own thing. So you have to go find that modifier. And that's why renaming it is very important because then it's much easier to find. Then I've popped in a function here, find underscore mod, I've specified which group it should be in, so zero being the first group, and what it's named in quotations there, so envelope zero. And then the last thing is just negative one. We don't need that parameter, so negative one it is. As I've said, four lines there because it's four groups. And now when I slide up the attack control, it will actually control all four groups instead of just one group because I've attached four separate lines of code to that. So that's method one, if you will. That is basically typing out, renaming everything, scripting it four times with four different lines of code and making sure that everything is moving correctly. There is a different way, a way that requires less lines of code, less copy and pasting. This is using a while loop. And that is the method I've employed for KaleidoSky. When you jump into KaleidoSky, the first thing you'll notice is seven different groups. We're no longer dealing with just four. And it's very common for sample libraries to grow well beyond this number of groups, particularly if you're doing things like choke groups versus open groups for hi-hats, for example, you have a group for each type of sound. If you're doing things like multiple articulations on a violin, you might have a staccato group, a legato group, a pizzicato group, and consordino group. All these different groups can pile up very quickly. So your code ends up being super long and very hard to kind of pin down and make sure everything's running okay. Using a while loop changes this. I've still gone through every group has a modifier, each modifier has been named to ENV and the group number. So I've done that housekeeping to begin with. Now, when I come into the script editor, you'll be able to see how it differs. Still declared my attack slider, no different. I think that's this one here. However, when I come down, I've now got a different set of code that looks a little bit different to what I had before. This is mainly employing what's known as a while loop. So while something is the way it is or isn't a particular number or whatever, do this action on repeat, on loop, until you reach that condition and then stop it. So what we can do is set up a loop where it incrementally increases the group number in that script line, and then it will do that for as many groups as we have. Let me show you the way that it works. First of all, you are going to need to declare a variable. I've just done declare dollar sign i, i standing for integer. Um, I do also have a second one in there. Let's ignore that for now. The first one there is the dollar symbol i. Now, when we jump in here, the first thing I do is on UI control attack, just like before. The first thing I'm gonna do is set my variable of i to zero. So when I touch this knob, the very first thing it's gonna do is set it to zero. This is important because we're gonna use this variable, this i, as a counter, and it's gonna count through the groups. So inside this while loop, and it's gonna be while this number is less than seven, we're going to do the same function. However, we've swapped out a few things. So it's still set engine par, it's engine par attack still, still the attack variable. This time, instead of the group number being there, zero for the first one and six for the very last one, I've got dollar symbol i, I've got my variable there. So my variable starts at zero. So for the very first time, it's gonna be zero. But then 
after it's finished this parameter, it's going to increment or inc the variable by one. So that means that the dollar i will become one. And then when it goes through the loop again, it'll swap out the dollar i for a one. That's how it's working. Every time it does the script, it increments the variable and that variable counter goes up and then allows us to target the next group in line. And that group happens all the way until it reaches seven. Seven is one above the last group. So I've got groups zero to six, which is a total of seven groups. And so I've said, while the number is below seven, keep running this script. Once it increments up to the point where it gets to a seven, it's no longer going to run, it's gonna stop. The beauty of this is if you add more groups later, all you have to do is keep naming them the same way, ENV7, ENV8, and so on, and just change this number here to whatever is one above the last group that you have. It makes the script very adaptable and much better for longer, bigger libraries. As I said, we've done engine par attack, attack, and dollar symbol one. We've still got a few things that this variable is swapping out. The find mod, for example, again, we had the group, so we've simply swapped that out for the dollar i. And also ENV, the group name is gonna change. So ENV becomes ENV zero on the first one, ENV one on the next one. And that helps step through the naming as well. We can use that in place of the name. So that happens, it then increments one and it repeats the loop until eventually it hits seven and stops the loop altogether. So this method, method two, if you will, is a lot more adaptable. It's able to be increased or decreased depending on how many groups you have. And it takes up a lot less space. You won't be copying and pasting the code and changing the group numbers manually yourself. And therefore, if you have 14 groups, you've got 14 lines of script, you've got the same amount of script and all you're doing is changing the number that it's counting up to. So I do hope that this has helped you out. This is something that took me ages to find and eventually was buried in a forum somewhere. Hopefully you've done a quick Google search and found your way here faster than I did. And I really hope that this has made an impact on your journey. Let me know in the comments if this has worked or just a simple like. It would be wonderful to know that I've helped someone out. On this channel, we're gonna continue diving into these sorts of instruments and making these sorts of investigations and learning a thing or two along the way. So do subscribe if you wanna be around for that. Otherwise, until next time, Catch you later.